Hi everybody, welcome to uh, the virtual Power BI days. Rishi is going to present something about aggregations and what if scenario modeling. To me, it sounds like something I would never ever be able to do, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that Rishi will make me believe that I will be able to do it. And this explanation <laughs> will be awesome like always. Um, so please do visit the SQL Slack channel and uh, the Power BI days channel at the SQL Slack here. Um, Rishi has a link at his first slide up there, aka.ms slash SQL Slack. Um, we're putting everything up there. You can ask questions there live, get live answers. Um, apart from that, it's all up to Rishi now. Please do share your knowledge with us, Rishi. Sure. Hey, hi everyone. Thanks very much for attending. Um, it's great for you to see so many people kind of give up their time on a, on a Sunday afternoon to to do this or something, what do you even? So um, let's say I'll be talking about aggregations, which is using the new composite models feature within Power BI, and what if scenario modeling, which is using a combination of the what if parameter functionality within Power BI, along with Power Apps and a connection to an Azure SQL database. So um, a little bit about myself, just to start. So um, that last talk was actually really, really relevant and really interesting for me, actually, because I'm a chartered accountant by background. So I started doing you know, a bit of reporting in, in financial reporting with Excel and got into data analytics through Excel, VBA, Power Query, Power Pivot, um, and really saw the, the potential for tools like Power BI to, to drive that data culture within organizations. Um, so I've worked for a lot of big big brand companies, consultancies, and banks um, in London. And now I work for Altius, who are a Microsoft Gold partner um, and really kind of cutting edge in terms of the, the Power BI and Azure space. So we do stuff with some really great clients. Um, really, you know, lucky to be working there and to be able to have the opportunity to to present at these conferences and, uh, you know, the community talks. Um, and that's the way I've really grown my knowledge and grown my experience with Power BI. Um, yeah, I've got a lot out of the community and I'd really encourage people to do as much of these themselves. So anyone on the call who's who's you know thinking, should I do a talk? I don't know if I know enough. Uh, you know, just go for it. Um, you, you'd be surprised how how valuable whatever experience you have will be to, to the rest of the community. So um, what we're looking at today is um, a data set that's 2.3 billion rows um, stored in Azure SQL Data Warehouse. So it's not untypical of what you might find in, in large corporates. Um, and I've used that example for, for that reason, really, to, to, to kind of highlight how you might deal with, you know, large data volumes um, in, in a way that, you know, Matthew was kind of alluding to, um, you know, around summarizing and aggregating that data to be able to, to deal with those data volumes in a gracious manner. Um, and so it doesn't grind your entire system down to a halt. Um, but what's really important here is to actually take a step back and think about well, what, are you, what is the audience that we really want to, to target these reports at? Because that's what drives what you need from an aggregations perspective and, and indeed a scenario body perspective. So I did a quick Google on New York City taxis and it said um, to, to run a taxi cab, you need a medallion. And in 2013, which is kind of actually when this was um, came about, you, it costs up to $1.3 million to get one of those medallions, which is a hell of a lot of money. Um, it's since fallen a lot with, with Uber and Lyft, but even then, uh, you know, it says now it's about $160,000. But we're still talking, obviously, people's entire life savings going into this. Um, so <clears throat> for someone considering to be a potential taxi driver, you know, you'd want to know how much money you could make or, you know, how, how long it will take you to break even to get your money back on this. Um, you know, what your, what your fares are going to be like average on the day. How many, how, you know, how, what does that translate to? So that's a really perfect audience for, for this kind of data analytics scenario. Um, so, you know, that we've got that use case then where we can start to, to, to look at that. Um, and, you know, I've assumed that some of the pain points are actually that they've got too much data to really handle. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll look at how we can actually see to, to do this. And, you know, that last point there around what I've seen with a lot of clients in, in the real world is, you know, it's, it's very easy to kind of take some small extracts of data and produce some nice Power BI reports. And then the challenges really come when you want to scale it. When you say, OK, fine, we've got, you know, last two days of data in there and, you know, that's great. But now we want to show the last five years. 
and suddenly it now went to billions of rows. Um, and the models don't scale so well. And that's where, you know, you, especially with you've got governance and you've got, you know, agile development and you're trying to deal with, you know, digital security and the architecture and all of that, it, it gets very hard. So I want to touch on that a little bit as well as to how you might deal with some of this. So um, before we go too, too much further, let me show you what the solution looks like um, at the end. So this is um, the Power BI report. So I start off with a cover page looking at um, the number of trips that we've got. So 2.38 billion between January 2000 and December 2013. On the content page, I start with the kind of scoping template, which some of you might have seen before. If you've seen any of the other things I've presented, it's looking at who the audience for this report is and what are the key questions that they want. Uh, and this is what really drives how we design our data models, because by understanding those questions that we want to answer, we can know what dimensions and measures we essentially need. And that's what drives then the data model that we need in order to be able to answer those. Um, and I put this actually sometimes in Power BI reports, because when someone's coming to them, it's showing them exactly what questions this report is going to answer. So they already know whether you know this is going to answer the kind of questions they've got in their minds coming into it. Um, and if it doesn't, then at least you know we can make that could be a conversation around what what else could it show? Could we use natural language Q and A, for example? So we start then with a kind of fair and tip overview. Um, see if this map loads. Yep. Um, so this is looking at the various um, t questions that we had around what time of day is it best to take trips? What's the average fare? And is it kind of affected by weather? So here we can see by the various different time buckets, we can see that the most number of trips are taken in the evening uh, between 6 and 11 p.m., which you might expect. But the highest fares are actually um, early morning slots. So including tips, at least, that's when you'll get the, the highest fares. Hovering over it, we can see a report tooltip that's showing the breakdown of that particular uh, this all the journeys in that particular slot so how many obviously you see the vast majority are short journeys um and actually that's probably true for for most of them um and then we can see that actually even though the, the majority of journeys are short journeys those are obviously the ones with the, the shortest fare with smallest fare which is what you'd expect because obviously the longer the journey the more the more you're racking up on the meter um, and we've got all this cross interactivity. So this map box hasn't loaded properly. It's in the, I've got it in the browser as well. Um, the idea here is you can select particular regions um, and you've got that cross filter capability to be able to say, right, let me focus in on, on a particular um, time slot. Let me see what affairs are for those. Um, oh, here you go, it's loading now. Um, and see then, you know, where, which regions that, that might be the, the highest fares that so you can see actually, I mean, you know, don't, maybe don't trust the data too much on this, but it looks like we've got some regions that have got very high fares. And we can then go and look at different time periods and we can see how many trips are in scope of what we're looking at. Um, and you can see this is this is lightning fast performance, right? So it's it's a clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy, as Christian would say. And it's, you know, we've got that on that 2.3 billion rows. Um, and then once we want to drill down into trip level data, so the idea here is actually this data, the table that I'm querying this from, isn't at the trip level. So our 2.3 billion rows is in individual trip, whereas this is aggregated, but we can go in and drill through into a particular um, subset of that. So we could go in and drill through into trips detail. And now I don't know if this will load because I was trying this a little bit earlier this morning um, and it was, it was timing out. Um, well, actually, this should work. It's only 675 trips. Um, but actually, the connection to this database is quite slow. Um, and really highlights actually one of the reasons why you might want to use aggregations, because as we'll come on to, one of the challenges with direct query is, is performance um, on how long it takes to, to get that data, to query that data on the fly, um, as great as it sounds in practice. Well, dude, let me come back to this. Hopefully, we'll see if this page loads. Um, and we'll go through some slides. I just want to go, I'm going to set the context with slides um, and then show demos and then just come back to the slides because I've got them all there as reference material. So if you want to try and implement some of these patterns yourself, I've included what is hopefully a step-by-step -step guide uh, to be able to do that. So um, what we look at is to say the step-by-step -step guide. So I think aggregations of scenario modeling, I think we could follow a five-step process to be able to to implement these types of solutions so um we'll start with aggregations 
Um, first of all, just a bit of context as to, to why you might need aggregations. So this is a slide I've borrowed from, from Microsoft. It's looking at actually where you have direct query versus import. So imports, the kind of default mode for Power BI, you bring all your data into Power BI, into the Vertipak engine, and you can mash up different data sources together. You can apply ray level security. You can apply DAX formulas. Um, and it's really fast because that's what Power BI is designed for. It's the analysis services cube behind it. Um, so you get really good query performance. Um, the challenge is when you're dealing with huge, huge data volumes, um, as I say, which is not which is not untypical these days. And where where you know where you're dealing with these billions of rows, you might run into the problem where you've got too much data coming into Power BI and actually it starts hitting those limits of, of compressed data volumes that you can have in a model. Um, and also even actually, you know, on those times it takes to refresh billions of rows. If you're refreshing, you know, eight times a day on pro or even more on premium, you'll, you'll start to see that time that it takes to refresh. And actually your data then, you know, isn't really um, up to date very much because you can't refresh it so often. So when you're dealing with really big models, one option is then to go down the direct query route. Let's say this doesn't bring any data into Power BI. It just queries it on the fly when you're um, when you're when you have those visuals or when you do those particular um, filter selections or slices, it will then send the query it needs directly to the data source and bring back just the data it needs. You are limited in what you could do um, in terms of DAX and in terms of M, because essentially what it's doing is is creating any of those queries, translating any of those DAX queries into T SQL and passing them back in for SQL database at least, and then putting that putting that back. So you, you are limited with that. And also one of the biggest challenges with direct query is performance. Um, you can probably see that in the model that I've got at the moment. It takes a long time to get those queries and you really struggle, especially with something like SQL Data Warehouse. Um, so what Microsoft have done to, to help us with this is, is come up with this idea of aggregations and composite models. So traditionally, you've only ever been able to, your Power BI model has only ever been able to be an input model or a direct query model. Once you do direct query, everything's direct query. Once you do import, everything's import. Um, and that's always been traditionally the way it is. You have to choose. Um, what they've allowed you to be able to do now is actually have both within the same model. Um, so you can have an aggregate table that's import and a direct query table that has your leaf level data. So... The idea behind this is actually you get the kind of best of both worlds because you have the aggregations table, which is lightning fast. So here you've got your step, all your visuals are based on that or your kind of core initial visuals are all based on that. Um, and, you know, that that will be in input mode. So you don't have those restrictions that it will be, you know, fast performing. And then when someone drills down to look at individual leaf level data, so in this case, individual trips, then that's when it will fire off a query for those, you know, 600 trips that we looked at before, fire off that specific query and return the trip level data for those. And hopefully that should still be quite fast because it's such a small volume of data. So this is really the, the use case for aggregations. It's where you want to have both a granular data and, you know, summarized data in the same model. Um, but actually, you know, you don't want to necessarily do a direct query against the whole thing for mainly for performance reasons um, and actually the clever thing so this is composite models but the clever thing about the aggregations feature is that actually the user never even sees this aggregations table um, they just look at this um, you know direct query table essentially um, they look at all the all the field all the measures are based on here but the engine is clever enough to switch it automatically to the to the import table to the aggregate table um, in in real time. So it knows it you know it knows it knows which measures to use for which uh, it could it could use the import model for. So um, the first step in building these aggregations is to define your grain, um, and this is an example of a kind of bus matrix around um, Kimball data modeling or dimensions of measures matrix. And what it shows is your various measures that you're looking at along the top and then the grain of data or the dimensions that you have those measures by. So when we're looking at our full data set, our 2.3 billion rows, we can see that we have all of the measures by the most detailed grain available. So we have for each trip that we have, we have the date and time of the pickup and the drop off. Um, you know, obviously we, and that can be aggregated up into date, year, month and year. We have the longer lat of the pickup and drop off. Um, and we, you know, can then 
obviously aggregate that up into country and zip code. Um, and then we also have, you know, all the details, like how many passengers were there, what the medallion number was, and how long was the journey. So very, very detailed. Um, but what we have to really do is then go, you know, to the users of this report or the potential users of this and say, well, what kind of analysis are you actually doing? Do you know, if you're looking at 2.3 billion trips, does it really make sense to, to plot all of them in a map to look at individual longer LUTs? Um, you know, are you really going to be able to see anything on 2.3 billion roads? You, you won't be able to plot that many on a map. Um, does it? Do you really need to see exactly how many, what what the rain inches and temperature degrees were of, the, of each trip? Does it really make a difference whether it's 62.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 63 degrees Fahrenheit? Probably not. Actually, what you're interested in is was it hot? Was it cold? Um, because you know, looking at those factors that might impact your your fares. So. What you can then come up with by doing this type of analysis is a much more sensible level of granularity and in which to pitch your data. So all the reds are the things that I've kind of changed. So actually, I've only focused on the pickup locations um, and I've you know not brought in longer lats, but just the, the county level or zip code level, which I think is, is the same. Um, you know, I haven't picked up individual times because, again, it doesn't make a difference whether it's 1120 or 1125. It's, you know, the time bucket that we're really interested in. And even actually when we're looking at this kind of volume and this you know, level of data, date is considered not to be important on individual dates. It's more about how many trips and the average fare over a month. Um, and again, I say with the weather, with the rain and temperature, it's more about you know the kind of categories. So I've created my own kind of categories here to say, you know, just map them, the rain to if it's greater than zero and it's you know greater than three inches or something, then it's heavy rain. If it's otherwise it's it's raining, um, you know, temperature category, just looked at um, you know, what 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 it's, what that temperature is and put it into a category. So now we actually got that 2.3 billion rows down into 1.8 million. But we still have a very good level of detail to be able to do our analysis. Um, and, you know, so that 1.8 million rows will now be much more manageable in terms of what we're trying to do. So um, this is just saying, actually, one of the important things to do is to be able to document your data. So, you know, this is kind of a data dictionary. So this is a list of all the fields in that database with an example value, a description, and then a view of how we're using that in the reporting. So, you know, where we're grouping them up, where we're um, using them directly or using them as a measure. And this kind of thing is really important to, to start thinking about right from the beginning and start documenting because it really helps you to get on the same level um, as, as, as the potential users and to clarify where you're going before you go far too far down the route of building something. Um, and this is this is an idea for Starnet, a conceptual model. Um, and again, this is this is entirely non-technical. So you know, you're not you're not talking about technology here or tools and you know Power BI. You, you're not even talking about dimensions and measures directly, even though obviously this is what this represents. Um, but what it shows is you know you're you're talking about what are the things you want to capture. And what are the things you want to capture those by? What are the things you want to look at those by? So you want to look at trips and fares, and you want to look at them by county and by rain category and temperature category and so on. So these are the kind of things that are really useful, say, to, to put together. Um, for the other steps, I'm going to show them um, as a demo, and then we'll come back to the slides and some screenshots just as a bit of a recap to, to show how we do these. So, um, oh, here you go. So that's, that's finally loaded. Um, now, this is the best I could get the icon map um, working at the moment with this with this kind of data. But we've got then a list of all of the trips, um, and then we've got the the, the lines showing from each pick up longer lat to each endpoint longer lat. I did try and be ambitious and have a play axis on these, so you can start to see the journeys of individual um, taxi drivers on days. Um, it was a little bit much of this database, and I think that's uh, that's probably a phase two activity. But you, you get the idea that when you drill down, you can start to see individual trips. So um, the first step, I think, with with building this is to look at this as an import model. So, you know, not to consider the the um, composite models at this stage or you know to consider how you're going to use aggregations. But just to think of this in terms of what is the level of data? How do we get in that one point eight million rows and how do we then build the visuals and the reports that we need to answer those yeah, that's going to serve that core bit of analysis. Um, and in terms of kind of where where that comes from, so ideally, I think you want to do. So you you've got two ways of building that aggregations table for doing those those kind of group buys and summarizations. 
you've got one option is to do it a source or as close to possible a source so you know in this case it might be a sql view and we look to materialize that um you know that that view into a table ideally you know using the store procedure and adf or something um i didn't have access to to the database so i i did it through actual food, uh, data flows um and i created the data flow on on a premium tenant and then just uh, brought that data in so i wasn't doing it in here the other option obviously is to do it within power query um, and you've got the group by option in there which allows you to do that uh, my challenge with that is is it is very slow and you're you know you're, you're bringing that into your report and it's not necessarily with these large data sets what power bi is designed designed for um it, it's designed for you know smaller data sets with with much more of a self-serve use case um so this is the SQL query that I ended up running. So I actually ran this just as a native SQL query. As I said, in my case in, in data flows, but ideally this would be in the SQL database or in you know a data platform. Um, and we would look at then, you know, just got some case, simple case statements to say, join it back on the weather table. And when it's null, then uh, if it's greater than one, then it's heavy rain. If the weather is greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's very hot and so on. And you know some simple statements in here case statements to say when it's one then it's single passenger otherwise it's multiple and then just return those um those fields that we need so this is the this is the query that takes a very long time to run this database but once it's materialized or once we've got that in a table um it's only 1.8 million rows which is then much more manageable um and if we look at that then in in the um in the data model actually I've, i'll show you just the input model So we've got then our table. This is our 1.8 million rows table. Um, it has got for each each of those categories, so for month, year, so not individual date level, but by month, by duration bucket, by raining category, temperature category, and so on. We've got then the number of trips, the average fare, and we've got some measures that, that work out um, some combinations of those. And then we the idea is to bring this exactly as we can into a star schema. So we have our various different dimension tables. So passenger count, rain categories, and for these ones, I say because I've made up these these passenger count categories or rain categories myself, um, at least in import mode, um, I'm able to then um, just use enter data. So just to be able to go into here and say um, enter data, and I can enter in the values that I want as my dimensions, and then use those as a one to many on my model. So you know, nice and easy for an import model. Um, so. In terms, of, I would actually still recommend doing this, even though actually to turn this into a composite model re requires you to delete those tables and um, all your visuals will break. So you have to rebuild those. I, I still think the effort is worth it because actually making sure you've got this right, you've got the right dimensions on here, you've got the right type of analysis you can do is, is absolutely fundamental because it's going to be the core still um, of when you do a composite model. But to switch this to a composite model, what you need to be able to do is go in and actually all of your dimension tables need to be deleted and actually rewritten as direct queries against the database. So they all need to be direct query tables. So you bring in your fact table um, as a query, um, a direct query query, and actually that your the fields that you return from your direct query have to have your dimension keys in there as well. So um, this was a view that also then had those particular, um, you know, anything I needed to have in there. It, if I had rain category or things like that, I made sure that I actually put that as part of the view. So I used those same case statements in the direct query, um, native query SQL here to be able to, to return that. Then the other thing we then do is go into each of our tables and um, make sure these can then come from the database. So when we do, that's probably a bad example but um what i had to do with this in order to be able to to get these from the database is um as i say you usually what you do is have these stored in the table and you can just direct query and connect to the data source that then has your dimension values in there and so i didn't actually have access to the underlying data to do this so i actually made a table within a sql query <laughs> essentially but it's only a couple of rows so it, it works fine um, you know, select this as union or select this as union or select this as. Um, so this is how I actually, what I had to do to be able to have that as a direct query. So, you know, that's quite important. That was a big gotcha for me in terms of 
in your all your dimensions then have to start life as direct query um you can't use enter data or a spreadsheet or anything like that because that makes an import and that doesn't work for a composite model so this is this was our underlying um direct query fact table and then we have all of our dimension tables which are also being brought in as direct queries um what we then do is um join up these dimension tables to both our um they're both one to many so we join them up both to our aggregate table and to our direct query table um and then what we make sure we do is then we change the settings of these so you'll see this one um in the properties window we've got the mode set to import for our aggregate table and the set to direct query for our um fact table for our direct query fact table and then all of the dimensions we set to dual and what that means is it allows that allows it to be able to be used for both purposes depending on what level you're analyzing at so if you're analyzing a query that can be satisfied purely from your import table then it will use import and it will it will use that fast um, join on there but if you're doing using any kind of query that actually needs to go back to this detail and it can't be answered from your import table or tables then it will be able to pa it will pass those values into a direct query so essentially it will pass in these values as part of the where statement that it puts back to the sql database to get that data on the fly so if you know for those 600 rows um i still was filtering down on some of these and um you know it then took those and said where rain category is hot where um the month year is this particular month so it passes all those back in so it allows it to be able to be used for for both purposes um once we've set that up so we've set up our tables and all our relationships and we've set them up as dual we can then do manage aggregations and this is the trick to making sure that power bi understands that actually um where how it can use the import table the aggregate table instead of the detail table for those purposes so you it what it shows here is you right click click on manage aggregations it shows all the fields in your aggregation table now all of these kind of um dimension key fields i've actually left blank you can put them in so you can do group by so duration bucket is grouped by field trip um time time minutes something it's called trip duration minutes but actually this is more for readability because actually because we've got the relationships here this will happen automatically anyway we don't need this it's not really going to use this where what it is going to use and where we do really need to make sure we set is our numerical values so here where we've got total distance we've got the sum of trip distance miles some uh, total fares the sum of fair amount in your in your underlying um fact table in your direct query fact table now so what this means is it will say anytime you've got a measure where you've got v trip fair amount it will know actually if i as long as my dimensions are, are are the same ones that tie into my import table i don't need to go to v trip to answer this i can go straight to the import table and use this column in the import table total fair instead um same thing as if i'm counting the number of trips i can do that on the direct query table by doing count rows but actually it also knows that if this can also be answered by the trip count field within my input table and it'll be much faster to do that than using the count rows on the, on a 2.3 billion row table so that's what it will do so it does that all in the background so actually all your measures that you define are actually on this table now so you define all your measures on this table so we'll define number of trips as count rows of v trip we don't actually define any measures on this table we define them all on the v trip and, but it knows automatically it will switch it to import mode um it'll switch it to import and it'll take it from trip count on there instead as long as we've got these all set up so back to the report uh, we can see then um if we look at just to just to show this we can see that we've got number of trips which is going to just be count rows v trips um and but when we when we drag that on so that's what the fields we're dragging on on there it will use to say the import table it will use that field in that aggregate model um because it's much faster um and you can actually use that studio to be able to see whether it's hitting the aggregation table or not so um this is um it, this is this is really really useful um right let me let me just pop back to the slides and i'll show you kind of just recap on on where we've got to with aggregations so the steps you need to do to follow these so the first one was defining your grain um, looking at the level of granularity you need b 
building that input model, changing that into a composite model. So changing all your dimensions into direct query and then dual um, and bringing in your fact table. Um, so, so as I said, so to build an input model, I think it's best to do it as close to source as possible. Um, making sure you've got that nice star schema that built up your input model that can answer the questions you need. Then it's around creating a composite model. So um, the direct query fact table needs to have your dimension keys in there and all the dimension tables need to start life as direct query queries. Um, you then need to set all your dimension tables to dual. Um, so through storage mode, set them to dual. Um, and that allows it to then, as I say, to, to play for both sides. I probably should be a bit more careful in my language on that one. Um, it allows it to be able to be used in both scenarios. And um, define your aggregations. So using manage aggregations to be able to tell it which fields. And then you can build um, your drill through pages. So actually all your measures are defined only on your query table and actually it's recommended that you just hide your aggregation table the users don't need to know about it um, and you can check in DAX studio if you run a query it will have this thing in a query plan on the right hand side that says match found that means it's using the aggregate table rather than the direct query table um, and then build your drill through pages um, to be able to to show those so you, you put those fields in as your drill through filters and then it will pass in those values and it will pass these as say all into your where statement of the direct query queries. So this is these slides are here for, for reference material if you want to try and, and build these in yourself. In terms of aggregations as a solution, I, I think they are a very neat solution for what we're trying to do, where we want to see both levels. Um, you know, bear in mind that you do still have those direct query limitations on your DAX and data modeling. They apply to your detailed fact table as well as all your dual dimension tables, because all your dual dimension tables are essentially direct query tables. You're just saying, um, treat them also as import. Um, bear in mind two things. Number one, it does make your data model more complex. Someone's looking at this, you know, there's it's it's harder for people to understand what it is. And, you know, that goes against the idea of a semantic model being, you know, very easy to understand and being quite user friendly. And also they're not supported in analysis services. Um, this is, you know, if you're using Power BI Premium, um, that's fine, um, or Pro. But if you're using AS, you wouldn't be able to, to have this feature in there. Um, and you know, really looking at this, I you know, I would question actually whether whether you need aggregations um, or whether actually the same whether the same audience really need to see both both levels of detail in the same report, or whether actually they could be two separate reports and, and potentially have slightly separate audiences. Um, I, I have seen this thing come out this week actually about cross-report drill through. So now you can drill through from one report to the other. I don't know if it will work in this scenario. I haven't had a chance to give it a try yet, but if, if anyone does or has, um, let me know. It'd be really good to actually see because actually that could be quite a good alternative, I think, to aggregations. Rather than having it all in one model, have it in two and then just have a drill through from one report to the other. Um, that might be something that, that, that we could look at. So um, now we're looking at scenario modeling. Um, so that was the thing with, um, let me just show you briefly what how the scenario model thing works. Um, so the idea, so the reason I think we need scenario modeling is because if you remember my audience that we said this report is for, is for people who are kind of potentially considering purchasing, you know, for a very hefty amount, a, a taxi medallion. Um, and, you know, this type of analysis is useful because, you know, yes, you can see kind of, you know, where your biggest fares are, you know, where, where you can, where the most number of trips are done and kind of, you know, how your fares vary by you know, some different categories like weather. But actually, is this really enough? Probably not, because actually, does this really tell you how much money you're going to make when you're going to break even? Um, you know, no. So actually, this is where then I thought, okay, I was thinking back to my days as a financial model and thinking, right, well, you know, what would I do and if I was using, building an Excel report for a client with this? And actually, I would, I would build some kind of scenario model um, in Excel. And there's something I was quite keen to, to try out in, in Power BI. Uh, so I use all the community stuff to, to try things out before I before I do them on clients. Um, so what this is, is we have a base scenarios. So we have a whole range of scenarios that we stored in the, in the database. So we've got a few different scenarios here and we can see variables. So I've defined a few different variables, like which counties are going to be in the trips. How many journeys could you do in a day? How, what percentage of those will be in peak times? What percentage will be in um, short journeys? what percentage will be with rain and what percentage will be hot. 
Um, and what that allows you to be able to do then is actually capture the fares for those. So we can see then in the base scenario, and then we can compare that to um, a what if scenario. So these are using the what if parameters, and we can say, okay, let's go to, to let's compare that to Hudson. Um, you know, 108 journeys a day. Actually, that sounds like a lot. You know, let's let's be a little bit more realistic in terms of how many journeys we can do. Um, and actually, majority of those, you know, we can do a few a few longer journeys if we're not doing so many in a day. Um, you know, we can do let let's let's focus mainly on peak hours because you know I think that's that's going to be might spend more time in traffic, but that's where we're hopefully getting more journeys. And now we're able to really start comparing the impact of changing these variables on our fares each month and our total earnings uh, and now actually we're seeing actually 1.39 million dollars over two years i don't know if this data is real so you know before you go out and start looking to buy a, a taxi medallion but you know actually now that's starting to say actually your initial 1.3 million dollars you're, you're breaking even in this two-year period so maybe it's not so bad um and this is where you know this this now starts to look quite interesting and we think okay this hudson you know 60 journeys a day i think i can do that this looks this looks quite interesting. Let me capture that as a scenario and make that available to everyone else. So I click on Add Scenario. It shows um, uh, our base scenario that we've got loaded. So this Bergen, 108 journeys per day, and I say, okay, great. Let me add scenario. Um, I can give it now. It picks up the values from my what if parameter. So it picks those up into the Power App. So it's the Power App form. It's loaded in here. I can give it a name, so I can say Yan driving around Hudson, and we can say, right, this looks like an interesting scenario. Let me capture this into the database, um, and now this should update straight away. Uh, there you go. So now we can see it. This is now coming from the Azure SQL database, but we can see it. Um, Yan driving around Hudson. Um, and now that's our, that, that's one of the scenarios that we could then use as a comparison as a base scenario. Um, and then we can, we can start to say, all right, what if we took that scenario and, and tweaked it a little bit to, to, to bump up the number of fares, number of journeys we could do in a day. So I think this is, this is quite, hopefully you, you see, recognize it's quite a cool example of what we can do with, with Power BI and, and using some of the related tools. Um, conscious of time, let's go into some detail as to, as to how this was built. So, um, all right, let me see where, where, where did I save that actual report. Here you go. Right, so what we do is we start off with looking, building out our what if scenarios um, and these different slices. So to do that, we go to the modeling tab and we do new parameter. So I've done this for each one of these. Um, and it comes up, we give it a name. So this would be, for example, number of journeys, or we'll do percentage of short journeys. We want it to be a decimal number between zero and one, incremented by 0 0.1. And we add that slicer to the page, and we can do that for, for all of these. And what that does is it creates tables um, with all your values in there. So it actually just uses a DAX formula to generate all of those values between 0 0.1 and 1. And it gives you a measure that is just a selected value. So whenever you change a slicer value, you have that selected value captured in in this measure and you could use then this measure in your calculations um bear in mind it's only relevant in measures so you could only really do it for this particular that you can only capture those on the page you can't build them into your data model because they exist on this front end layer so we've got then all these tables so we've got percentage of journeys and each of these has just been created through the what if parameters um what i then did is to say okay um let's look at those variables that we've got those percentage ones so the number of journeys is going to be something that we then use in a, in a measure at the front end to work out you know to multiply it by your average fare but what we want to be able to do is work out your average fare for these variables so i've just created a table this is just enter data and i've just created 10 rows 0.1 to 1 with four columns in them but what i want to be able to do is have a table that then takes every combination of the variables that I have and works out the average fare for them. So what it needs to be able to do is I need to say, what is my average fare for, you know, where I've got 10% of journeys less than 15 minutes, where I've also got any one of these. So, you know, this might be one combination, 10%, 20%, 30%, 50%. 
every combination we need to kind of work out and then work out the average fare for those. Um, and also then for each month and for each county so that we can then use those in the graphs. So this is done using a um, calculated table. Um, so the first thing I've done is created just that table with all the combinations in them. So I've just done a cross join of those columns in this variables table. So a cross join of each of those columns. Um, and what that gives me is uh, a table with 10,000 rows, which is um, however many I've got there. And it has all the combinations of all of those four variables. So 0 0.1 to 1 in each one. That's my first kind of base step in doing that. I then need to be able to use um, scenario count. Sorry, these were formatted. Um, you know, let me let me just open up DAX Formatter to put these in there, make it a little bit easier to read. So what I did for these scenario, scenario calcs table is then use those table variable combinations with the ones with 10,000 rows um, and use those in a summarized columns. So what this allows you to do is to be able to say for all of my combinations of county, month, and for each of these rows in here, for each of these columns, for each, all of those, each of those combinations, give me the average fare for short journeys, the average fare for long, for long journeys, and I've basically just defined these as measures. So the average fare less than 15 minutes is just a calculate on an average fare where the duration bucket is less than 15 minutes. And this is where the duration bucket is not less than 15 minutes and so on. So what summarized columns allows you to do is to be able to use measures to be able to create calculated values for a range of different field values. Um, and I've, I've just done it for where it's greater than 2012, just to, to give me a two year value, a two year re, uh, range in which to look at. And this table then has in it um, 2.86 million rows. So you know, it's a fairly it's a fairly large table, but it's just calculated. It generates you know, quite quickly um, using using DAX. And it gives me then for each combination of county month for each combination of my four variables. And then gives me those values. So for that, you know, for Suffolk, Jan 2012, where it's 10% of journeys less than 15 minutes, 10% with rain, 10% peak time, and 10% hot, it gives me um, 150. Um, it's my average fare less than 15 minutes, greater than 15 minutes, raining, not raining, peak of peak, hot and cold. So then I've got all of those. Um, now what I need to do is use these values and calculations. So I have these um, various ones here, and I can say, actually, what is my average fare for duration bucket overall? So now I'm looking at, you know, for the duration bucket that I've got. So now, now I'm using these percentages. So I'm just doing a weighted average, essentially. So I'm saying our percentage is the percentage that we've got here. So this is 0 0.1 in this case, uh, for less than 15 minutes. And then the one greater than 50 minutes is going to be one minus that. So it's going to be 90% that we do less than 15 minutes. So one, one percent, uh, 10 percent that we do less than 15 minutes and 90% that we do over 15 minutes. And I just times those together to do a weighted average of the two. So percentage under 15 times a fair under 15 plus oh, the fair, this fair under 15 is obviously coming from our summarized columns. Percentage over 15 times a fair over 15. And I could do that for each of those categories that I'm looking at. So duration, rain, peak and temperature. And then we've got an average fare overall, which is just, uh, again, the average of the averages. So we're looking at actually what would we do overall. So we're taking the fare that we've got, duration, the rain, the peak, and the temperature category, and just divide it up by four to give us an average fare for each row. So now we've got a fairly big table, but it has all of our calculated values in there. Um, we then just have a concatenation column, which is just the concatenation of, of those. Um, what we can then do, is define our what if rate our what if average fare is then going to say look at what we've got selected in our what if parameters so what we've got in terms of um, number of journeys per day but also each of these percentage values then use lookup value to be able to return that average fare overall so it looks up average fare overall where your county is the county that you've got selected in your what if variables your uh, month year is where you've got your selected month 
Um, so I've just created a copy of that month table. Percentage of peak times is where you've got from your selected value and your wallet parameters, wallet parameters, and it looks them all up and returns the average fare overall. Um, actually, this was this was running quite slowly, and I, I ran this by Alberto uh, when I was in Amsterdam. And one of the things that we actually did to speed this up was to actually make sure we did the lookup against five columns. So initially, I was doing it against a concatenation column, um, and it's it was quite incredible actually the speed difference by doing it over five columns over one compared to one because each of these five columns have fewer unique values uh, and that's the kind of thing that makes a big difference with with performance so now we've got our what if average fare um the next step is then to put these into a database so just to set up a very simple azure sql database with these parameters in there and bring in this as a direct query connection so um we can go into there and i've just got my values in scenario a, a table called scenario one so this is one um, I just set up myself, just as your SQL database, and it just um, brings back the scenarios that we've got. So it's just a direct query connection to that um, and brings, captures these variables. So these are the ones that I'm capturing now through here. Um, and that's what then you have your base fare. And your base fare follows, in terms of working out what your base fare is, your base scenario, it's uh, essentially a very similar calculation. Um, I think it's this one. Uh, Base scenario. Yeah, so it's a very similar pattern. You look at what you've got selected in that scenario one table, which is your direct query table to the database. You look at what your values are and then use a lookup value to return the average fare overall for those sets of parameters and returns the fare on that. And then obviously your total earnings is basically your number of journeys per day times your fare. Um, and that gives you then your, your overall solution. Um, Next, the last step in this, and, and actually one of the ones I found probably the most challenging, was to create this power app to be able to capture these what if parameters and pass them back into the database to have as a base scenario. And for that, I um, the first thing you do is you publish your report to the workspace uh, without any power apps or anything in it, publish it just as is, and you go into um edit report on here and you add in the power apps custom visual so you add in that power apps custom visual and you drag in all of those measures that you had as your what if parameters so we drag in each of those into there and we also drag in for the scenario table for the direct query table we drag in um, the scenario number or the scenario name, whichever whichever one's the unique identifier, and we click create new. What we then do is we have a power app in here, and we connect this power app to that same SQL database. So we add a data source, and we connect it to, to there. And once we've done the create new, we also have this item in here called Power BI integration, which allows us to then reference those Power BI values. Um, and then so I've got a new form that's got this Power BI integration. First thing I did was to create a, the first screen that shows your base scenario and we have a view form in there. So your data source from this you'll see is actually my New York City taxis. And the um, if we look at the, the items on here of the view form, so the data source is, is to say that database. And then in terms of items, it's looking at making sure that we've only got one scenario selected in our Power BI. So this is going to be here, whatever scenario we've got selected in that dropdown. It will look at the number that we've got selected and do a lookup on there to return all the corresponding values. So that's your the item property of your view form will then return um, this first Power BI integration dot data dot scenario number. So we, this is why we need to drag scenario number into the Power Apps, um, and then we use that Power BI integration data dot scenario number to say filter my database for that scenario, and then all of these are just basically coming in from that database with those values. Then we've got a button on here to navigate to another screen that has new scenario. So this is then one with an edit form. Um, and this edit form 
again actually has the same data source and this is important again the data source for this needs to be that table that we're essentially writing back to that database that we're essentially writing back to and in our items um, we have defaults dot dbo scenarios which is fine it's just saying actually your defaults are there because this is tied back into the database that we're writing into and that's important because when we click submit that's where it needs to write the values back into um, and then even though these are all editable the only thing i've left is the default of blank and you know it's display mode property off here so your default value for this one is going to be blank default is blank and um, your display mode is going to be editable because we want it, the users to be able to edit them. For the rest of them, I actually just want to pick up the parameters from our Power BI report, the what if parameter values, and I don't want the users to be able to change that. So what I do for those is I have a default value. Uh, I don't remember which one it actually stores the default value one, one of them. Um, is it that one maybe? Yeah, so here we do the default is the last Power BI integration dot data percentage of journeys less than 15 minutes value. So what this allows you to do is then pick up that value for the what if parameter. That's why we needed to, this is the measure name, uh, which is just selected value on your what if parameter table. So that's why it's important we drag that into the fields bucket in the Power App, and then we can reference it from here um, as last Power BI integration dot data. And then also just changed the display name on this to be parent.displaymade.view. So I just added a dot view on the end. So then these, even though it's an edit form, these are read only essentially. Um, and on the scenario number, um, that's just looking, it gives it a new scenario number, which is looking at the last one we've got in our database, the last ID column, and just added one to it. So it needs to have a unique identifier when it writes back. Um, actually, probably don't need that because if it's set up as a primary key, it will auto increment anyway. But um, in case you're not, you know, that's that's a way just to reference what you've got on there and give it a new ID. Um, and then finally, in the submit button, um, so the default for a submit button is just to submit form. Um, the trick with this now um, to get that instant refresh, to get that instantly coming up as one of our base scenarios, is this new thing that has come up in Power Apps V2, which was launched about a month ago. Um, is this Power BI integration dot refresh. Now, this will only work for a direct query source, which is why we have this database as a direct query um, to that database. But what that will allow you to do is as soon as we've entered, as soon as we click submit, it will write it back to the database. And then back in our Power BI report, it will refresh that so we can see it straight away as one of those base scenarios. Um, I found that quite, that, that was quite neat. We've got a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to run through again the slides that I've got here for reference, if you want to try and do some of this yourself. Um, so defining your variables, you set up your what if parameters, you build a calculation table. So here's the ones where I've just done enter data with 0 0.1 to 1, and then done a cross join of them to get all the combinations of the variables. And that's your 10,000 row table. Um, then create, use the summarize columns function to be able to give me all the combinations of those variables plus all the corresponding measure values. So how many, what the average fare is for those. Um, created your calculation logic. So these are the calculated columns that I then had in here. Let's say, have a look at these, um, look back at these for reference if, you, if, you're, if you're interested to see how it's done. And then this is the one that gives me the fare overall, which is basically taking each of these and just doing an average. So it's an average of, of the average fares that I've calculated for each category, for each area. Um, your measures are then going to be um, using these measures, which are your what if parameters, and then returning the corresponding fare. Um, we then want to capture the scenarios in the database and use, use the same kind of logic to pick up your base fare that's coming from here. And then finally, we want to use this power apps to be able to um, auto populate these values into the database. So we, um, publish it to the service, put in a power app, click on create new, add all your measures plus the scenario number. And then in here, we for our view form, we have um this is this is what we need to have as our item. So we just say actually pick out your scenario number. And then for the edit form for the add scenario, we you know we leave our scenario name or the stuff we want people to enter as blank. 
but then the default order of the ones we want to pick up from your what if parameters, we just use the measures in there. We reference the measures by using Power BI integration of data and the measure value, and we change the display mode to view. And again, on, on submit, we just use the Power BI integration dot refresh. Um, in terms of just quick evaluation on, on this, the scenario modeling, um, I think it works very well for, for simple logic like we're doing here with the averages. Where you're doing a lot of interdependent logic and lots of complexity, I'm not sure this kind of approach would, would really work. I mean, that that, tech, that that approach of having a table with all your variable combinations, this, you know, has 2.8 million rows. Um, so you need to be careful about the kind of sizes and, the, you know, how many variables you're looking at. You want to keep that at a, at a sensible level. Um, I did really like this um, ability to be able to have that Power BI integration dot refresh. I think that makes it just much more seamless, that integration between Power Apps and Power BI. And um, just as a you know, word of warning, it took me a little while to, to figure out how to do that. There's not much out there on the internet that actually shows you how to use this Power BI dot integration um, function within Power Apps very well. So hopefully, if you are trying to do something similar, hopefully these, these examples will, um, will help. Right, sorry, that was a... Uh, Quite well, we're totally just coming up to to the hour. Do, do you have any questions, Jan? No, there are no questions at the moment. Um, it was a lot to take in. Uh, yeah, I, I think people are still mentally paddling through it, <laughs> trying to come up with uh, with how they are going to implement it at their company uh, or, or their customers. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The, I loved it. It made several things clear for me, though. Oh, so, yeah. As, especially, I loved uh, how you're using the Power App to do the multiple mm. uh, what-if scenarios. It I do have a question here. Oh, no. Mike is saying, and hold on, this, this might blow your mind. He's saying, this was a great webinar. He has his compliments. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, that's it for then, I, I guess. If nobody has any questions, yeah, we're getting more and more reactions. Great webinar. Um, Brilliant. Really? Yeah. <laughs> obviously, obviously, if questions come to you and you know you you have a go at trying any of this stuff yourself and you get stuck, just drop me a message. I'm I'm more than happy to to watch stuff. I love I love helping people in the community because actually, do you know what? That I learned so much from doing that. So you know, I'm not I'm not someone to to, to ignore mm -hmm. questions that are coming. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I guess we'll say goodbye for now. Uh, I'll talk to you later uh, anyways. <laughs> if anybody yeah. has any other questions pop up, jump in the, the SQL check uh, Slack uh, on the Power BI Days channel. Get in touch with Rishi via Twitter or LinkedIn or I don't know, whatever you are on. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's it. I'm off for lunch, and I'll see all of you in about an hour for Scott's Bell session, making Power BI, Power BI do things it probably shouldn't, which is <laughs> going to be a very interesting <laughs> session. <laughs> we, we, will, we will get guilty of that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll see you all later. Bye. Sure. Thanks, guys.